Right. Good afternoon. Um, tell me, Jeff, what are your first memories of Stigurzy? Uh I think, I think the first thing I can remember was when I was about maybe three, four years old, living in this house. Um, in the front garden, there used to be a big pile of logs. And I can remember my grandfather cutting them up by hand with a handsaw for the firewood. That's about my earliest recollection of Stigurzy. I can remember Northfields being built a year later and moving across to one of the new houses in Northfields just before starting school at Stigursey School. And, uh, and how long were you at Stigursey School? I was at Stigursey School until I was 11 years old. Uh, at that time we then they built a new school at Williton and from 11 we started going to Williton. Previous to that, Stigursey was an all-age school. And my classroom, the last classroom I was in, was at the Ackland Hood. The big room at the Ackland Hood, which also doubled up as a cinema. Uh, first day at Willington School was a bit of a shock to the system. <laughs> the size and the number of people there, we weren't used to it. And we were a bit lost in the crowd. Mm -hmm. Can we go back a little bit? Can you, yes. can you just tell me about Stigursey School? Stigursey School? Stigursey School was a lovely school. I, I started in the infants with Mrs Hurley. And uh, two years in the infants class. Then we moved up to the next class, which was a Miss Jones. Uh, and that that's probably my best class because that's where I learned to read properly and I really enjoyed reading there. I then went to the third class which was at the Ackland Hood and each day we had to walk down after a morning assembly, walk back again for lunch, walk back down there again after lunch, then back to the school again for afternoon assembly before going home. Most of the time I spent walking up and down the village. But, but yes, it was all right, we enjoyed it. And my, while we were at this class in the Ackland Hood, my job was monitor for the accumulator for the class radio for the music lessons. So every week I had to go to the garage and get, the, get a new accumul or recharged accumulator for the radio. <laughs> Could you describe what the school buildings were like, the classrooms? Up at the, the classrooms, there was um, four classrooms. The main, the two top classrooms were divided by screens. There was one big room divided by screens with uh, a space in the middle for the assembly for the other children to go into during assemblies and everything. And, and each class held about 30 children. I was heated by a big, big stove. And at the back of the school was a big, big pile of coke, which we all took turns in carrying the bucket. Uh, uh, and at the back of the school, there were school gardens where we done our gardening before in the wall down into the, what is now the glebe field. Uh, and at the front, there was no fence like now, it was just a wall. And if you went over, you went over, and that was it. Uh, and where were the toilets? Uh, the toilets were at the back of the school, and down some steps. Girls on the left, boys on the right. And they were really old-fashioned. <laughs> and the, the, the canteen was on the other side of the road, which used to be a garage, the big room, and they... They still used the petrol pump or TV old pump that was outside for tractors. And, uh, what, was the, what was the playground like? The playground was very rough. It, was, um, it wouldn't, wasn't cobbled. It was, it was stone, but not cobbled, just stone on there. And it, it was very rough. But we used to play football on it and cricket and whatever. And the girls used to play netball on the one on their side. And it, it's nothing like now, it, oh, 
I don't think anybody, if it was a health and safety risk, I don't think you'd be allowed to play on it now. <laughs> did, any, did anybody hurt themselves? Oh, yeah. But it, <laughs> you got up and carried on. <laughs> Nobody t- you didn't take so much notice. Like, like now you're t- taking in and washed off and everything, but now you, you, know, you just got up and carried on. And the, ste- the headmaster lived in the house next to the school, and he had um, paving slabs like, down through to his gate. In the winter, when it's hard frost, we used to make a slide on that and run and slide along that, much to his disgust. And <laughs> but yeah, he wasn't a bad headmaster, Mr. Williams. <laughs> Taffy to most. <laughs> So you say your uh, father's family came from the village. Uh, <coughs> yes, what, did, what did your father do? <coughs> uh, my father he worked at Fairfield, and it, in the years just before he joined the army, he was valet to Lord St Audrey. And after the war, he came out and he um, worked at Cannington Creamery for um, Peter Hallett. Then and he was sort of drove the lorries and. Worked in the dairy as cheese maker. Uh, he also ran Stigursi Football Club for 25, 26 years from when he came out of the army, that is. Uh, grandfather, he was a farm worker. He worked on the land all his life. But during the First World War, he was a horseman. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so as a young boy and a young man in the village, what did you do for entertainment? How did you pass your time? Well, in them days, I think there's more to do than there is now because we were never here. We were always out around the fields doing things, always. Any day off, weekends, evenings, we were out along the bro- especially the brook between the church and Newnham. We were you, you mainly walking along at the one, or the. Brook at Mill Stream, we were down either down there fishing, catching tiddlers, and that. We were always out doing something. Uh, after mischief most of the time, but uh, we, was, I know we used to go off and do a bit of rabbiting, take a dog, and we'd do a bit of rabbiting, whether we catch anything or not, but we'd still chase it. When the, when the hunting was on, we'd go hunting, follow the hounds. Uh, Beagle hounds that used to go at Lowestock and Kilton. We used to follow them a lot because all they did was run, and we used to run with them. It kept us quite fit and healthy. Uh, yeah, that's, that's and there's quite a gang of us. So I don't know. Was there any, apart from, say, the football club, was there any other organised activities for young people? Yeah, there was a cricket club as well. Gersey Cricket Club. Uh, they had quite a good team, but that just folded because lack of people willing to play and help out with the work. So they just that just folded, but the football team kept going. Uh, so, uh, so when you left school, what uh, did you do then? Oh, you wouldn't know that. Did <laughs> when I, I left school, I left school in 1960. I went to Glidden's at Willetton as an apprentice mechanic. But uh, I couldn't stick the cycling to Woolitton every day in the winter. So much of my father's disgust, I packed that in and started work for Guy Payne <laughs> building. And from Guy Payne's, I joined the army for 10 years. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And when, when you came out of the army? When I came out of the army, I went for milk marketing board. Doing what? Twen- lorry driving, 20 years. Yeah. And then got made redundant there, and I went to Gerber, and I was there for 15 years. And I got made redundant again 11 months before retirement. <laughs> uh, yeah, no retired man in leisure. Oh, <laughs> try to help the young ones. So um, you obviously uh, married. I'm married, so yeah, second time. So, yeah. so how was court- courtship in days gone by? Well, courtship in them days, so, um, no, it was, quite, it was all right, really, because most of the time we went to the beach. And in the winter, we used to go to Bridgewater cinemas and 
uh, embassy cafe, so it's called drinking coffee. How did you, how, is it, so were you caught in local girls or Bridgewater girls? Local. Local. So if you went to Bridgewater, how did you get there? On the stage going bus. <laughs> uh, enterprise buses ran by Mr. Haybittle of Otterhampton. We had two a day. I believe it was one in the morning going in, one in the afternoon going in. On a Saturday you had three, you had one in the evening for the cinema. But it always left a quarter of an hour before this film finished. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's, it was, yeah, it's all right. But, uh, yeah, we could have done with more transport, but so we didn't have it, and that was it. We just put up with it, cycled, walked, or whatever. So, you, your wife's family, are they what, what's their background? The first wife came from Barnstable. And the second wife, they come from Bridgewater. Um, the first, I met the first wife at a wedding, an army colleague, and the second one we just met in, and and you know, just went from there. Uh, yeah. Um, so, what has been um, the impact, in your in your opinion, of Hinkley Point A Station when when that well, arrived? Because you were just leaving school, then, weren't I you? was. Yeah. Um, well, Hinkley Hinkley A, a started just before I left school. I think it was in 1958. It started. Uh, uh, yeah, it was a great impact. Um, all the, all the farm workers left the farms and went for the more money at Hinkley, which I don't blame them, but I left the farms a bit bare. So th there was always plenty of jobs for us to do, weekends or evenings, on the farms to help fill in the space of the people that left. And we, we made a little bit of pocket money by doing that, and it was quite good. But uh, the actual impact as such, uh, yeah, there's a few around and there's a few fights and everything, but it wasn't wasn't all that much because they was down that way out of the way. They were they were bussed in by Taylor Woodrow on the buses and bussed back out again. And a few that stayed on the camp, they came out to the pubs of an evening, weekends. And, uh, most of them got on very well with the villagers, and we had quite a good time with some of them. And when left school and started drinking, and got to know the, them a bit better. It was quite quite good. Uh, they've been a big help to the village over the years. Say. In in what way? Well, <coughs> more people have come and brought more resources, more knowledge. I mean, before I don't even imagine it. All farm workers, and hardly anybody had moved much farther than Bridgewater, outside you know, outside of the village, and and people coming in from everywhere brought all the knowledge in, and we all. All learnt by their knowledge and by things. Yeah? So you think it's been beneficial? I think it's beneficial. Yeah, that's, that's my opinion. I think it is. Um, yeah. So has the um, countryside around changed very much? Oh, the countryside has changed a lot. Yes. Uh, well, uh, just the road itself from Cannington to Hinkley Point is. That split Wick Park in half, uh, and as you s you still see parts of the old road on, or used as laybys and everything. But yeah, the countryside and the, and with the falling of the elm trees, now you, before you couldn't see hardly anywhere because of the amount of trees. But now you can see everywhere. No, tr not a tree in sight. Now, I'm talking about elm trees because they were all over the place. What about yeah. types of crops? Oh, the types of crops, yes. Is now you have oil seed rape, you never had before in my younger days. Uh, you got a lot of winter corn now that we never had. We only had spring corn, and it is now cut with a combine, whereas we had a, the old binder and sheaves. I had to go stitching, <laughs> it's good for rabbiting when they came out after you picked them up. And when the first combines came in, 
you had the corn in sacks and they were dropped on the ground and you then had to lift them from the ground onto the trailer to be taken in, which was quite heavy work. And some of them weighed nearly 200 weight, some of the bigger bags. <laughs> I suppose someone else has told you that as well. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, uh, there's not so much as a root crops grown like kale, uh, like mangoes now. There, in our young days, there's quite a lot of mangoes, and the women used to be out in the fields hoeing, hoeing the mangoes to get them, you know, just thin them out and keep the weeds down. Uh, what else was it? Oh, kale. Uh, but they still grow a bit of kale, but sugar beet, you don't get so much sugar beet now as we used to. Mm. And not so many farmers grow crops, but the ones that do grow them, grow more. Uh, 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 yeah, I think that's all about all I can... <laughs> absolutely fine, absolutely yeah. fine. Um, what about the actual... Um, buildings in the village, how is the kind of shape oh, of the, the, the village? The village has changed. Um, you take Burgage Road uh, through there, or just to the right of Burgage Road as you look at it from here, that used to be Plowright's farmyard. And he had two entrances, one to the, like, to the left of the two houses, one to the right of the two houses. And on the, one on the left would go in and that was his cow sheds in there where he did his milking. And the other one went right the way up to, through now to where the town close is, up through that area. Uh, we lived in number four at Northfields, and our back garden, back right onto his yard, and he always had his mango cave on the, well that's that fence, with straw, to, covered it first of all with straw, then with the hedge cuttings. We're going to um, start again with a bit of a break because uh, Jeff's microphone fell off. So yeah. he was just telling us about the mangoes up against his yeah. back fence, I think. Yeah. Um, uh, the mangoes cave was covered with straw, then a layer of brambles and hedge cuttings over the top to keep the frost off. And then right across from that, he had his Dutch barn with hay and straw in. But the track through the centre went up to the fields which is now the Burgage and Town Close and Meadow Gardens. Yeah. Yeah, that was old gardens. Uh, well, one field was a strip field which belonged to three people, but I, I believe he only had one part of that field where he grew kale. Yeah, and he, he milked about 20 cows um, on the end of the farm, had the milk stand. And another farmer called Tommy Cable who used to got a farm across now it, when it's now St Audrey's close um, and he used to take his milk up and also put it on the same milk stand as Plowrights. Each morning the lorry would come along collect the milk and away they go. Yeah. And, yeah. and I think it was only about 20 cows that he milked. He never had any other animals there except one horse in his early years for work horse and he then changed to a tractor he got real modern old Fordson <laughs> uh, I don't any, think uh, sorry is there anybody um, in the village um, that you can remember as being sort of rather a character well there's two there's two one lived at Fulbrooks, which is about a mile out, they're going towards Fiddington, and the other lived in Fiddington. And Friday and Saturday night, they used to cycle from Fiddington and Fulbrooks to the Fox and Hounds, get sidered up. Well, one was called Snuffy Richards, he only had one arm. And the other one, Fred Chilcott, nicknamed Jola, well, that was an uncle of mine. And they used to cycle back. Nine times out of ten on the way back, they'd fall in the brook, cycle into the brook. And if not, they'd go over the bridge and into one of the ditches each side, which is also deep. Well, Snuffy had to stay there because he, there's no way he could get out with one arm. So he's, he just stayed there until somebody came along and rescued him. 
<laughs> and uh, let's see, as a character, there's a old Gent Payne, Guy Payne's father, he's a bit of a character. Um, Liza, we call, always called her the witch in the high street. She was always always dressed in black and always sat outside her door. And we used to run past her because we was half afraid we call her a witch. But she, I mean, she was harmless. <laughs> when we got older, we found out. But as kids, we just just run past. Uh, yeah, I think, I think that's about it for that. I just, um, it's the, all gone in memory You mentioned now. earlier about the, the bomb maker. Oh, um, uh, Edward Till was brought down from London and he lived in a village in a, a, I believe it was Quantock House he lived in and he was, a, he was a bomb maker. He was brought down during the Second World War and he used to cycle to ROF at Puritan every day and back for his bomb making skills. It was so how far uh, is that? Oh, well it's nine to Bridge it must be 18 miles each way. It's got to be, isn't it? Uh, 18 miles each way. Uh, used to do about 10 hours there, then cycle, cycle home again. All winds and weathers. Uh, <laughs> it was mainly time bombs that he specialised in. And he, I think originally he was a clockmaker and then he went on to, during the war he passed his skills on to the bomb making departments and, and, he, and he, was, he was a bit keen on Ruth Clark who lived in the dairy and her father Charlie, Charlie used to deliver the milk, Charlie Clark on his tricycle with two churns in the back and his pint scoop and come round to each house and you have how many scoops you wanted of milk and into your jug and that way. And Charlie Harris, he he squared each day with each weekend with his trucks that he made and cut down or break off wood and and back and sell it as kindling to make a bit of money for cider. I think that's all the money was made for in them days was for cider. Was it was a lot of cider drunk? A lot of cider was drunk, yes. Rather uh, than beer. Rather than beer, yes. And where was um, well cider was part of the wages as well on the agricultural side of it. Where was the cider made? Uh, the cider cider was made at um Lowstock Farm. Uh, stock and also at Peden Farm. They made cider. And that's the only two places I know that made cider around here. There's, there's, there's one at Overstoy, I couldn't, can't remember what his name is. And there was one at Cummings, I can't remember his name neither. But the most popular ones was Stoy. So they must have made lo a lot of cider? They made a lot of cider, yeah. yeah. Uh, we, we used to go have a glass whenever we went with parents and that. And it was all right. <laughs> get the taste <laughs> can you tell me about any sort of big days that happened in Mr. Jersey special events celebrations and coronation I remember the coronation we we had we had a a day at the recreation ground football field and doing all sorts of races for these kids and stalls and well, there's lots going on. I can't remember all that was going on, but I remember the races. Um, and we used to get two, two shillings for winning the race, a shilling for coming second, and six months for third. So we tried to win as many races as we could and tried to get as much as we could out of it. But I can remember we, that we all had a mug, a coronation mug, and in the mug was a bar of chocolate. And I can remember that. Um, I can remember ha that there was always a concert, a pantomime co type concert at the school, done by the football club, and that was always around the Christmas time, uh, and that was done to collect money for the football club, and there was always a lot of 
I can't remember the names, but a lot of local people that went in doing their thing, and it was quite a good night out. And, 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 and the vicar, Mr. Scholl, Reverend Scholl, he was took part in it as well. He, good. Yeah. I can't remember any other big days. I don't think. How about weather events? Weather? Wet? Well, down at Castle Street, there used to be a, a wagon house on the end of the mill. And on the wagon house, there's a mark near the top, near the roof, where the highest flood water had ever been. Um, I can't remember, it was, the number was cut into the post, what date it was in the mark. I can't remember what it was offhand, but yeah, uh, that was going back quite a few years. Approximately high off, how high off the road? How well, that, that would be about six foot. Maybe, it may be not, the flood might have only been about five foot, but I think the roof was about six foot. And the job to, now, it's good, thinking back, the job to tell about the difference between the roof and the mark was, but it was quite high. It was uh, shoulder heights to me, I suppose. Uh, 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 that was good. I, and, and I remember seeing, only once I can remember seeing the mill working as a child. Uh, only, Remember, I went down with my grandfather for something else, and the mill was going. And I've always remembered it going, but that's the only time I've ever seen it working. I think it was shortly after that that it stopped and never went again. After uh, uh, and the Chigis there, they had their the coal yard, the coal shed. Tom Chigi and Tom and Purse Chigi, and the grain store, and the. Where and the two, the two, the Dutch barn in Castle Street. One side was corn, the other side was coal. Yeah. Yeah. Then delivered the coal and that, uh, the corn to the farmers and collected it from the farmers and delivered it to whoever wanted. And we used to go down and get chicken feed down there, and get the sweepings and that for the chicken. And, 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 and do the coal run, you had an old Albion lorry that you had to swing to start it. A really, really old-fashioned lorry, and he had that one for years. Uh, uh, ben Pierce down at the mill. He, no, oh, he he wouldn't let anybody on his land, so he couldn't couldn't go anywhere near it. Uh, and uh, so, how did he keep them off? Oh, he was chased. <laughs> he ran after you. <laughs> <laughs> no, we we didn't bother too much with that then. <laughs> um, how do you see um, you, you, you said that Hinkley Point A was definitely a, a boost of it. Yeah. How do you see the future with Hinkley Point C? <sighs> That's a hard one, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> we're all biased one way or another. Yeah. Um, I would I would like to think that it would be great for the local people job wise, but I don't think it will be. I think there are too many Eastern Europeans coming to take the jobs. That's my view. But I mean, the country needs power, so it's a good thing in that way. But it would be even better if the local people got the jobs instead of Eastern Europeans. Mm, yes. Yeah. Okay, um, is there anything else you'd like to tell me? No, I don't know about it, I think. Because <laughs> um, 1962 I joined the army, and I was in the army for 10 years, so I was out of this area for 10 years. Did, did you notice much change in the village in those 10 years? So yes, I did. Yes, I did. about that? Um, well, when I came home, there was a caravan site down at, um, I forgot the name of the field now, Chris Strongbox site. There was a caravan site down there for the Hinkley Point workers. Uh, Meadow Gardens and Town Close had been built. There's a few name changes to streets. 
a lot of the farmers had gone down at um, the Church Street where the blacksmith used to be, uh, Perry's, Gordon Perry. That, that was a farm, that had gone, that was two bungalows, or one bungalow and one on the side of it. Um, Harold Morgan down at Paddens, he'd finished milking and everything, he said it had all been sold. The Warners were just about ready to give up the farm and it's just completely, completely changed. So do you think B station almost had more effect than A station? I th I, yeah, I think B station had, well, I noticed more of change with B station and A station because of the time of not being here and coming back. Had I stayed here and saw the gradual change, probably wouldn't have noticed so much. But you know, when you look at it, leave it for a long time, then look at it, yes, it was a big change. I would, I would say it was more of an impact than A. <laughs> okay, well, well, we'll we'll stop it there. Right. Right, Jeff, you're saying that um, your grandparents moved into this house when well, it was brand new in 1937. Yeah, that's. Would that's you like to tell us about some of the changes that happened? Well, this is the sitting room. Uh, in their days, this was a sort of sitting room, dining room. Uh, they had the, just there where the fish tank is, that used to be, a, used to have a big range there for cooking on, big black range, and grandmother used to blacken it every few days and everything, but, uh, and that also heated the house. What, what was the fuel? The fuel was coal and logs, mainly log, more logs than coal, but just a coal to get uh, just a bit of body and then logs to keep it going. In the kitchen, they had a a big boiler, copper, for doing the washing in, boiling at the washing, and lit a little fire underneath it and to keep the water hot. And next to that was the bathroom, but it only had cold water. So you had to heat the water in the copper first to fill the bath, then like that. Uh, but now the bathroom's upstairs. The larder's gone, what was there. And there's no cupboards now. It was just a sink and just a bare kitchen. Or scullery, as they called it then. And, and that was about it, really. And that, the three bedrooms. And, and I think there's about seven of us living in here. There's grandparents, uh, auntie and uncle, and three of us. Uh, seven, yeah. Well, we were lucky. We got when the Northfields were built. We had the first one, of the first ones of them. So, what date was that? You moved to Northfields. Approximately 1949, 48, 49. And they were a bit better appointed inside. Oh yes, a lot different. <laughs> a lot different. Hot and cold water. Uh, an electric cooker, <laughs> no range, just a normal fire, or two fires, one in the sitting room, one in the kitchen, and a fire upstairs as well if you needed it, and, which was never used in an hour time, and, and two toilets, one downstairs and one upstairs. <laughs> yeah, it was a nice change. So, so I expect your grandparents would be a lot more comfortable now Oh, definitely, they definitely, they would. They they definitely would. I remember the table, let's give me bearings now. Yeah, the table used to come this this way. They had a sideboard there against that wall. An armchair there, an armchair here. No, no settees. And everybody else had to sit around the table. And that was it. That's, that's all that was here. Uh, 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 did they have electric light? Yeah, yeah, they had electric light, yeah. Yeah. And, and mains water? Main, and mains water, yeah. But my auntie that lived at Fulbrooks still had the pump on the well and no electric. No, nothing electric. No. They, every time they wanted water, they used to have to pump it up in the well. 
<laughs> and the other thing, everybody kept chicken in them days. But now, you can hardly see anybody with any chicken, but every garden, practically every garden had chicken in. Now, uh, now it seems nobody wants them anymore, except a few, just a few people got them running around. But, uh, <laughs> Okay, well, thank you very much indeed. That's quite right.